Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, I am Joanna Lee. Um, I'm Joanna Lee. I'm the Vice President of uh, Strategic Initiatives and Legal at CNCF and the Linux Foundation. Um, and we're going to talk about the DEF, code, uh, DEF CON Code of Conduct litigation uh, and what Code of Conduct enforcers and community leaders can learn from it, uh, as well as some best practices for managing legal risk when, when you are enforcing uh, code of conduct, uh, codes of conduct and responding to incidents. Um, and just a little bit more about my background. Before joining the Linux Foundation and CNCF staff, uh, I, was, uh, I practiced law for about a decade and a half. Um, and also did strategic consulting, and I've always been in the tech industry. I love, love, love open source, open standards, open hardware, all of open collaboration. Um, and I've, I, I just love living at the intersection of economics and business, technology, and law and policy. Uh, so we'll talk about the uh, pending lawsuit against the organizers of DEF CON, which is an annual hacker conference uh, in the security space, um, and what we can all learn from it. And uh, we'll go through some uh, best practices and tips for managing legal risk. Um, and by, uh, by show of hands, how many uh, people in this room are uh, community leaders or moderators or, uh, or organizers? Um, excellent. Um, Excellent. And how many uh, of you uh, in, have a role in uh, enforcing codes of conduct? Fantastic. Well, thank you all for uh, the work you do in the space. It's so, uh, so valuable and important, um, the work of keeping our communities healthy, thriving, and safe. Uh, so the vast majority of the code of conduct incidents where the, the severity of the behavior is low, you know, for example, if it's just you know, rudeness or you know, ar arguments about why a pull request wasn't merged, the legal risks are very, very low. Um, when the legal risk increases uh, is going to depend on the type of violation and uh, its severity as well as what remedy um, you're considering. Uh, so, in the event that somebody was physically assaulted, or there's uh, sexual harassment, um, or if you're considering permanently banning somebody from a community, uh, or uh, issuing some type of public or semi-public statement that could have an impact on their either their personal reputation, um, or their their professional life, or their business, um, that's when the legal risk uh, is much greater. Uh, so lawsuits can be brought by a variety of parties for a variety of reasons. Um, so lawsuits can be threatened or brought by the accused person. Um, and you, those are typically uh, when, it, typically the defense is, well, I didn't actually violate the code of conduct or the penalty was too harsh. Um, and the types of legal claims tend to be in the libel, slander, defamation arena or intentional uh, interference with uh, a contractual or economic relationship. And I'll explain later uh, what that means. Um, and also, uh, a couple of things. One is this is a very US-centric um, presentation based primarily on the US legal system. I am a US lo licensed lawyer. Uh, I'm not licensed to practice in other jurisdictions. I do have some experience with international law, but, but this is going to be based primarily on US law. Also, I'm going to try as hard as I can to make this understandable to non-lawyers. Um, but just like you know, engineers, when you're speaking with business folks, even the same company, sometimes you have to do a little translation, um, and there's an acronym they don't get. Um, please, please, please interrupt me if I'm speaking legalese and there is a term you don't understand. Um, so lawsuits can also be brought by the party claiming to have been harmed by the incident. And this is usually going to happen uh, if if they're harmed and um, they're blaming the conference, you know, conference or community organizers or project leaders for, for having, if, if they would allege that you know, there's a responsibility to protect the community or community members from harm, that uh, the community leaders or, or organizers knew of this risk and did nothing uh, about it. So if there's, for example, if there's repeated uh, incidents uh, by the same, uh, same accused person, and uh, nothing is done about it, that could increase the, the uh, and then harm really results, uh, that could create an, uh, a situation where a harmed party uh, would be motivated to and, and could have grounds to bring a lawsuit. Thirdly, 
Um, if uh, employees uh, of a hosting foundation or if it's a company that is uh, sponsoring uh, an open source project, if employees um, are the ones who have been harmed, uh, that could also create a situation of uh, workplace, um, uh, workplace employment claims and, uh, for example, a hostile work environment. Uh, so we have a case study in, process, in progress. So uh, the uh, organizers of DEF CON, uh, which is a security uh, hacker conference, annual hacker conference, um, have been uh, sued by an accused person. Uh, so uh, just a, a little bit of background about it. So this is an annual conference. Um, and uh, late last year, uh, an ex-employee of a company called Social Engineer LLC, um, that's uh, Chris Hadnagy is a plaintiff in this case. Um, he is the owner and president of uh, Social Engineer LLC. So one of his ex-employees uh, didn't directly go to the uh, DEF CON uh, organizers, but went indirectly through a third party. And uh, uh, essentially, uh, we don't know. There's, and we don't know whether uh, it was part of an official complaint or an unofficial complaint. There's actually a lot we don't yet know about this lawsuit. And later on, I'll explain a little bit why that is. Um, but uh, the, the event organizers found out through a third per party um, that there were allegations of uh, abuse, uh, harassing, and controlling behavior by this ex-employee. Um, and then the uh, conference organizers uh, claimed that they connected with at least half a dozen other community members who uh, had uh, similar complaints about this individual. Uh, and for that reason, uh, they decided to uh, ban him from the event. We still don't actually know um, what the type of misconduct is beyond the, uh, that vague statement about uh, harassment and, and controlling behavior. So uh, additionally, uh, so, so DEF CON uh, conducted uh, its investigation and then notified Chris Hadnagy that he um, was uh, going to be banned from uh, all future DEF CON events. So permanently banned from this community. And they also, as many communities do, they publish a transparency report on their website um, that summarizes at a high level uh, what, uh, what code of conduct incidents have been reported and how they're resolved. And so there's a public statement on their website uh, in the form of a transparency report. Uh, and this is a screenshot of it. I'm going to go ahead and read this because um, this transparency report is both the motivation and really the subject matter um, of the lawsuit. Okay. So it says, we received multiple code of conduct violation reports about a DEF CON village leader, Chris Hadnagy, um, of the Southeast Village. After conversations with the reporting parties and Chris, we are confident the severity of the transgressions merits a ban from DEF CON. We have also taken the rare action to disband the DEF CON group uh, uh, DG, uh, DCG 414, code of conduct violations by the group's primary point of contact, and subsequent mishandling of the event left us without confidence in the group's leadership. Um, so there are, uh, there, there are a lot of things going on here. I mean, there's the incident itself, and then there, you know, there are uh, still a lot we don't know, but there, there's questions about the code of conduct enforcement process and the body. Um, so in August of this year, Chris Hadnagy, the accused person and, and his company, Social Engineer, uh, filed a lawsuit against uh, both DEF CON Communications, which is the organization that plans these conferences, and its, pre and its president, uh, Jeff Moss. And this is uh, filed in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Uh, so the, the essential facts that the complaint alleges uh, is that the code of conduct itself for DEF CON is vague and ambiguous. Um, so the accused wasn't really given notice of what type of behavior it did and didn't uh, prohibit. Um, also, it alleges that uh, Chris has never been, still to this day, has not been informed about what behavior uh, he engaged in that allegedly violated the code of conduct. Um, despite the fact that he's made uh, multiple requests. Um, he claims that uh, DEF CON Communications has not provided any uh, support or uh, evidence or any explanation whatsoever uh, justifying the ban. Um, and also that it was given to him completely without warning. He didn't know that there was an investigation ongoing, et cetera. 
Um, and this does suggest, I mean, although the complaint doesn't explicitly allege this, it does very much suggest that he was not uh, interviewed as a witness, that he wasn't given an opportunity to provide his side of the story or present his own uh, evidence. Um, so there are, uh, there's at least, uh, it appears that uh, one could make an argument that this investigation didn't follow all best practices for due process and that it wasn't a thorough, uh, a completely thorough balanced investigation. Um, so how is Chris harmed? Um, so he claims that due to these vague and ambiguous statements that nonetheless were very concerning because they do say the, the violations were so, so egregious that it warrants a permanent ban, um, uh, he's claiming that there was a firestorm of social media uh, commentary on this and that the community has speculated um, that it must be something really, really, really terrible like uh, sexual assault um, or other abhorrent behavior. Um, especially because this is a community that uh, supports supports uh, eccentricity and weirdness. Um, so if there's something he did that was so terrible that it warrants a ban, it must be, you know, people are going to assume the worst. Um, so he's claiming that his personal reputation has been harmed and damaged. Um, he's also claiming damage to his business dealings uh, through social engineer. Um, the complaint alleges that uh, several, uh, that at least one of his clients terminated uh, the relationship with Social Engineer, and that there are other potential clients that have refused to work with Social Engineer um, because of this uh, publicly known about ban from the DEF CON uh, community. Uh, and he's also claiming that this uh, resulted in emotional distress, uh, mental anguish, embarrassment, and humiliation. Uh, so the, uh, he's brought several claims or causes of action, um, and these are, these are uh, a lot of these are legalese words that just start, they're different types uh, of claims that a plaintiff can bring in, in, in this factual situation. One, and, and, I'll, and I will explain uh, what, what each of these uh, means uh, in, in a bit more detail uh, in the future slides. Uh, defamation is one of them. Uh, intentional and tortious interference with contractual relations is another. Um, invasion of privacy and false light is another, um, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Uh, so it's, there's, see, these are the, the different claims um, that are being brought. Um, so what, what does defamation mean? So uh, I'm going to go through, uh, so Eastern District of Pennsylvania, so Pennsylvania, every state has slightly different laws on what each of these types of claims mean. So the exact wording of um, what constitutes defamation in Pennsylvania might be a little bit different than, you know, what constitutes defamation in uh, California. Um, so here I'm going to be talking, uh, because I want to make this more universally applicable. If you actually read the complaint in Pennsylvania law, it's a little bit different what I'm going to present, but I'm going to present the more general definition of def defamation. So first there has to be a false statement um, that purports to be a fact in order for defamation, um, uh, for a claim of defamation to succeed. Um, there also has to be either a publication of that uh, or communication to a third person. So uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's you know, publicly available on a website. It could be uh, you know, saying something untrue about uh, a company to their, their customer. Um, that would be uh, an example of a communication uh, that could qualify for this element. Uh, there also needs to be some type of fault uh, amounting at least to negligence. Um, so it could be something, you know, in intentional, so an intentional lying, uh, intentional misstatement uh, would, would qualify, but it could be less than that. It could be just acting kind of uh, without, without any real regard to is this true or false. You know, it could be based on a rumor that you heard. You didn't actually make any effort to verify whether it was true or not. And, you know, if you communicate um, either to the public or third person something that turns out to be false and you're acting negligently, um, that, would, that would support a claim for defamation. And then there also needs to be some type of damage um, to the person uh, uh, which could, uh, or, or harm, to the, harm to the reputation um, would be, um, would qualify for this. Because invasion of privacy and false light is so similar, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about this next. Um, uh, and, then, and then talk about the defenses to both of them collectively. Um, so invasion of privacy and false light is very similar, um, but whereas uh, defamation is really about, uh, about reputational damage, uh, invasion of privacy and false light 
uh, the focus can be a little bit more on the embarrassment and humiliation and, and loss of privacy um, rather, than, uh, rather than the more objective uh, standard around, um, around uh, uh, reputational harm. Um, so false light is a, uh, a claim that involves uh, publicity, uh, some, so some type of public or semi-public statement um, that places a person in a false light and in a, in a manner that would be highly offensive to a reasonable person and that's made with knowledge or reckless uh, disregard as to the falsity. So uh, very similar to defamation. So uh, DEF CON communications, uh, their defense to these claims is, um, first of all, you know, it's true that you know, he did in fact violate the code of conduct. Um, and uh, also uh, the, uh, the defense uh, says that, well, the ban announcement isn't really, um, it's not really susceptible to de defamatory meaning. Um, it's clear that this is uh, presenting a subjective view. It doesn't say, you know, Chris did A, B, and C, um, and that's the truth, but it just says we conducted an investigation, um, and we found that the behavior was so egregious that we, you know, we wanted to, uh, to ban him. So that, that's, their, that's their argument in defense. Um, also, th they point out that the announcement itself does not say anything about abhorrent con uh, conduct or sexual misconduct, and you know, they're essentially not responsible for you know, what people may or may not uh, be, be gossiping about. Um, uh, I'm going. I'm, I'm showing a screenshot of the uh, of the announcement again. I mean, uh, just to just to have context again for appreciating um, that that defense. Um, so it does say uh, we received multiple multiple code of conduct violation reports. Um, you know that that is arguably true, right? Um, and Chris Hadnagy of the Southeast uh, about uh, Chris Hadnagy of the Southeast Village and after conversations with the reporting parties and Chris, we are confident the severity of the transgressions uh, merits a ban from DEF CON. Um, so it is phrased as an opinion statement. Um, and while this is, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, there's still so much we don't know about the case, so I'm just not in a position to really um, provide an assessment of whether I think, uh, you know, which party is right or wrong or whether they're, who's likely to succeed in this case. Um, but I will just say that, uh, this is probably, th I think that this is probably well worded from a defamation perspective. Um, if, if you read these statements, it's hard to argue that they're objectively false. Um, but false light uh, claim is a little bit, um, uh, there doesn't have to be um, such overt explicit falsity to, to succeed in a false light claim. It could be just, you know, you're suggesting something um, that is untrue. So for example, if there's a news article, um, you know, talking about, uh, there, there's a news article talking about, you know, how an organization has uh, engaged in, uh, you know, some, some terrible behavior, and there's a picture of an employee of that uh, organization in that news article, and that employee actually had nothing to do with the, um, the behavior, that just the fact that that picture is there suggests that they were involved. And so that person could probably bring a false light claim, even though inclusion, the picture itself doesn't, isn't actually, uh, is not conveying in a false statement. But there is a, a presentation of a, and, and suggestion that, that, in, that implies involvement. Uh, so another uh, claim has to do with the uh, economic damage that uh, Chris and Social Engineering, his company, claim to have uh, suffered. Um, and so this is intentional or atrocious interference with contractual relations. Um, again, a, a big legalese phrase um, that you know, essentially means this. So that there is a contractual relationship that exists between Chris or his company, Social Engineer, and another party, in this case, uh, his customers, um, and at least one existing customer who terminated that, uh, the relationship. Um, also, the defendant, uh, so organizers of conference, would need to have known about um, this contractual relationship. And at this point, it's not, it's not known whether or not they, they knew or not. Um, and that the defendant intentionally and improperly interfered with that contractual relationship. Um, and that the plaintiff suffered some damage as a result. You know, in this case, the damage is that uh, he lost at least one, one customer relationship. Uh, 
Um, and in DEF CON communications uh, response to the complaint, their primary defense was that they, you know, maybe some damage had resulted from their actions, but this third element has not been satisfied. There was no intention, there was no intention to um, harm uh, Chris or his company uh, by interfering with his customer relationships. Um, and there was nothing improper um, about uh, their actions in publishing a transparency report. So that's, that's essentially the core of their defense on this claim. Um, and the final claim um, is uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress. And in order to succeed with this type of claim, these, these elements need to be satisfied. So uh, there needs to be, uh, the defendant needs to have engaged in conduct that is extreme and outrageous. And, and again, this is, the, we're talking about DEF CON communications here. So the conference organizers would have had to engage in conduct that is extreme and outrageous. Um, they would have had to act intentionally or at least recklessly. Um, this would have had to cause emotional distress that is severe. And then under Pennsylvania law, also physical injury or harm, um, there's some case law that says physical injury or harm is uh, required. So DEF CON's defense is uh, that, you know, first of all, uh, Chris Hadden and his company have not been physically harmed in any way. Uh, but moreover, um, that there is nothing extreme or outrageous in publishing a transparency report. Um, and the, the bar for what constitutes extreme and outrageous behavior is, you know, it, it is fairly high. I mean, it really has to be atrocious behavior. Um, and so DEF CON is arguing, well, clearly publishing a transparency report is not, uh, is not extreme and outrageous. And furthermore, um, that they were trying to protect the community's safety and the community interest, that there was, there was, a, commu there was a larger good, public, uh, public interest and good that, uh, that justified uh, this behavior, uh, also undermining the, uh, the claim that it could have been extreme and outrageous. So um, the case is in progress. Um, DEF CON Communications has filed a motion to dismiss. And what that means is that, um, essentially what that means is they are, uh, they are they're trying to persuade the judge that um, this claim is completely meritless. Just by reading the complaint, it's meritless. We don't even have to go to trial. Um, we don't even have to go to discovery. Uh, the, um, so they're seeking dismissal before we prefer, proceed to the further stages of the um, uh, investigation. So if the motion is not denied, though, and, and it, will, it will advance, so it's possible that some of these claims will be dismissed, but if there is at least one claim um, that the judge thinks uh, there should at least be discovery of uh, factual evidence on, um, the case will proceed. Um, and then we'll proceed to a phase of litigation called discovery. This is where each party and their attorney gets to um, issue subpoenas, um, depose witnesses, um, and ask for do documentary evidence. Um, and I, I want to, this is really, really important. Uh, and I think one of the, the uh, perhaps the most compelling reason why we should uh, do our best uh, to avoid litigation um, with regard to code of conduct enforcement. Uh, in discovery, uh, highly uh, personal and sensitive information of reporters and victims and witnesses who participated in the investigation could come to light and become publicly available. And um, in order to make, uh, help keep communities safe, we need to create safe spaces for reporting. Um, and uh, litigation is unfortunately um, only under unusual circumstances, uh, can, very unusual circumstances, can parties get the record sealed um, so that, uh, so that the, uh, the information is not, uh, is not made publicly uh, available. Uh, also, uh, witnesses, reporters, uh, victims, they could all be compelled to testify. And that, uh, you know, for somebody who has, um, who has suffered harm or at least feels that they have suffered harm, you know, asking to testify in a, in a legal setting and you know, confront the person that you know, they see as an abuser um, can also be, it can be traumatizing and very, very emotionally upsetting. Um, so the, uh, the complaint uh, does, uh, in the discovery plan, um, does set out some of the intended discovery that Chris uh, Hadnagy and his company um, plan to conduct um, if the, the case uh, continues to proceed. Uh, and that includes information and documentation pertaining to the uh, code of conduct violation, 
identities of any fact witnesses. Um, they would uh, uh, depose all of the witnesses, which basically means, you know, not, not in a court, but uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a private setting. Uh, well, not, not exactly a private setting, but uh, uh, as part of a, an official proceeding um, uh, with attorneys present, um, they would be interviewing um, the witnesses um, uh, on record um, to find out more information. Uh, Chris is also going to seek information about the transparency report, uh, who the author was, uh, you know, and want to uh, interview them and find out what potential motivations they may have had, um, and uh, depose the conference uh, organizers as well. So issues that are likely to be scrutinized um, uh, include whether the, uh, and debated, uh, are whether the investigation is fair, thorough, and partial, um, the credibility and possible motivations of witnesses and reporters, and whether all available evidence have been considered. Um, the fact that, I mean, if, if it's true, what's said in the complaint, um, that Chris was never, uh, did not uh, have any notice that there was an investigation pending, um, and still doesn't know um, what the alleged misconduct is, um, you know, that, that does highly suggest that not all information had been considered uh, because they never spoke to the, uh, they never spoke to the uh, accused person. Um, so, you know, that, that's not necessarily going to um, result in success uh, on these legal claims that are being brought, but it, it does, you know, it, it does raise questions about um, the, the fairness uh, and thoroughness of the code of conduct process. There's still a lot we don't know about this. Um, because there's very little information uh, in the pleadings that have been filed uh, so far to date. And that is, um, that is very much intentional. So some of the lessons that we can learn from this. I'm actually going to start with a, the one at the bottom first. So there is a tension between, wanting, be, be, between presenting a very strong defense uh, in litigation and protecting privacy of, uh, of the victims, reporters, etc., right? Uh, the re part of the reason why uh, DCC, the DEF CON organizers, uh, ha they, could actually, they could actually disclose, you know, even at the pleading stage, they could disclose more facts. You know, this is a, the behavior he engaged in. You know, these are all the witnesses we spoke to. Uh, these are the dates and times that, uh, you know, he engaged in atrocious behavior, so on and so forth. They could have uh, included, in, in some ways, um, they could have bolstered their defense early on by including more factual background, but they didn't. Um, and although you know I I'm not involved in this and I, I can't uh, I can't speak for um, the organizers or their lawyers, um, I believe it's because they are trying very hard to protect privacy. Um, of the victims and reporters and their anonymity to protect, to protect them from both embarrassment and potential retaliation. So um, I believe, that, I mean, that's why they're really focusing on defects in the arguments that um, Chris has raised rather than uh, presenting facts in their defense at this stage. And they're hoping that it's going to be dismissed so we don't have to proceed to discovery um, and incur the stress and expense and potential embarrassment uh, to those who participated in the investigation. Um, so some of the other lessons learned about this, uh, any type of public statement that is potentially embarrassing is uh, often both the motivation for and the, and the grounds um, for, uh, for filing a lawsuit uh, by the accused. Um, if you are going to issue a public statement, uh, either stick to the verifiable facts um, or make sure you're presenting it as, uh, you know, as an opinion statement. Um, as I, I do think that the organizers of DEF CON um, did do that well, at least with regard to um, positioning themselves well to defend a defamation um, suit. Uh, the false, false light claim is a little bit, a little bit trickier, um, uh, as, I, uh, uh, as I explained earlier. Um, and if there are any failures in due process, you know, it's not going to look good when, that, uh, when that's scrutinized in, in a in court of law. So, um, you know, I know code of conduct enforcement is, uh, uh, oh, thank you. Um, it's stressful, um, it's time consuming, um, you know, but when we do cut corners, it, it, can, it can expose uh, expose you to more risk. 
Um, and yeah, we, we have five minutes left, so um, I'm going to I'm going to really push through these last slides. Um, but I am available uh, afterwards, and you're you're welcome to Slack, uh, you know, DM me in Slack or or email me if you if you have any follow up questions. Um, so litigation is very expensive. Um, that's one good reason to avoid it. Um, but it's also time consuming and stressful and emotionally taxing for everybody involved. The code of conduct enforcers, the conference organizers or, or uh, community organizers and leaders, um, the witnesses, uh, the, uh, the uh, victims, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and it's very difficult to protect the uh, privacy um, of, uh, of the people involved. Um, if, uh, if your project uh, does have a hosting foundation behind it, um, and it seems that there's meaningful legal risk, or you you know you, you need an assessment of whether there's uh, legal risk, you know I, I encourage you to get the lawyers involved at least to evaluate is this you know is this something that's going to need uh, legal support and counsel throughout the process. Also, uh, having documentation that shows that your um, that your investigation was fair and thorough is also is also very helpful. Um, these are some of the factors that increase legal risk. Uh, we talked about, you know, if there's public statements that uh, increase the risk of, uh, well, that could cause reputational damage or embarrassment. Um, also, if, uh, if uh, the actions taken could impact a person's career, you know, being banned permanently from a community that somebody, uh, you know, their business or professional life depends on um, is going to, you know, could, could be motivation and grounds for a lawsuit. Um, obviously, if, you know, laws were violated, um, and then if the person who engaged in the misconduct or alleged misconduct is a community leader or an employer or contractor with a hosting foundation, that creates uh, another set of risks. Um, and then if there is physical harm uh, suffered, that also increases uh, legal risk. Um, note that when there is meaningful legal risk, it can be helpful to have the lawyer perform the, a lawyer perform the investigation. And the reason why is because of attorney-client privilege. So when a lawyer performs an investigation, there's something called attorney-client privilege that attaches to both their conversations with the Code of Conduct Committee and um, foundation staff, if there, if there, are, there is a foundation, um, and also the notes uh, from their investigation, so notes with interviews, et cetera. So there is, and, and when that privilege attaches, that means uh, in litigation and discovery, um, that's, uh, the court can't compel um, disclosure of those documents. Um, so that is a that is one reason why you know again only if the only if there's meaningful legal risk um, it can it can be helpful to have a lawyer do the investigation. Uh, note that any message you send to anybody, including victims, reporters, uh, the accused, uh, if you go to litigation, those will become public. Um, or you know they will be public. They will be scrutinized, um, or they will, at least they will be scrutinized by the court. Um, so uh, also be thoughtful about what um, what you are discussing in spoken co conversations. You know, for example, a private code of conduct committee meeting versus uh, in email and writing, uh, because anything in email and writing, um, you know, even if it's just you know you're joking around, you're being sarcastic, and you're like, oh yeah, you know, the accuser is you know such a such a jerk or whatever, you know, you're you're just making uh, it's you, you're thinking it, it may not be, you may not think it's uh, it's a serious conversation, but if that gets exposed in litigation, uh, you know, whatever you said could be used against you. Uh, insurance. This is a very. Uh, this is a question I get asked about very, very often. Um, so Linux Foundation and CNCF uh, does have insurance and it does cover uh, volunteers, but every insurance policy has lots of exclusions and limitations. Um, also, if uh, a community member is acting in their individual capacity rather than under the authority uh, within their role as a volunteer, um, that's not going to be covered by insurance. Um, and insurance cannot pay for, I mean, although it can help with the monetary cost of litigation, it can't protect you from all the other costs, meaning the, the time, um, the stress, um, how emotionally draining it is. And then it also can't um, protect uh, the, uh, the privacy 
um, of victims and reporters. Um, so we are out of time. I'm sorry we don't have uh, more time for Q&A, um, but thank you so much for being with me today, and thank you for your good work in the community, and I will be around in case you have questions. <laughs>